Well, obviously it is Seder time. I do hope that for any who had Seders, I hope everyone got to, but if I hope those celebrations were meaningful and that they were, according to last week's message, full of hope and inspiration, and that if you're connected, conducting a second night Seder tonight, that it will be exactly the same. Seders are a huge part of Passover, obviously. Um, it is the recollection and the remembrance. They're very meaningful for us as disciples, too, because as we all know, Yeshua and the disciples conducted a Seder for the last meal before the Passion, as it's called. Yeshua's, right, Last Supper, Yeshua's Passover Seder. Or do we actually know that? Do we actually know about Yeshua's last meal? Whether or not this was a Seder or what this was. Furthermore, more importantly maybe, do we know when this last meal was? And it's a, a, that's actually a bigger question because everyone has questions all the time, every time at this, every year at this season. How was three days and three nights only from Friday? I mean, the sign of Jonah. We're not going to get into all that. That's well established that any part of a day counts as a day in Jewish, Jewish understanding. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three days and three nights. You gotta not take things quite so literally sometimes when you read the Bible. There's poetic literature, there's all kinds of connections and all kinds of things, that, but that's not our topic. Three days and three nights, that's, another, that's a question that's commonly asked. And what I wanna talk about, you know, is what day was this meal that Yeshua had, that we all celebrated last night, this huge, pivotal, central event in the, in, the, in the life and death and resurrection of Yeshua. When was it? There are a lot of opinions, and this is not significant in the sense of salvation or even the validity of the story of Yeshua's crucifixion, but it is significant to have a working knowledge of this chronology in terms of apologetics, and I don't, I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm not sorry. Apologetics uh, in defense of the biblical text, reconciling contradictions. There is a real difficulty, because if you're honest, if you're honest about what you read in the Bible, there are things that look like contradictions and discrepancies. There just are. And when you read and hear this term, inerrant, <clears throat> that's a pretty significant issue when we're talking about inspired and inerrant scriptures. Because if there are contradictions, apparent or discrepancies, let's use that word, that creates a challenge. So having a working knowledge and understanding of this is important. Now, this material is very, very complicated. There's no way around that. And I limited, you know, picking the night after a Seder when you were probably up till one o'clock drinking is not the best night to delve into, a uh, best day to delve into very complicated stuff. But this is the season. So we're going to talk about it. You'll be happy to know I limited my wine consumption to the, to the small amount required by law so that I could speak very clearly to you today. Mom, don't just be quiet. Just kidding. <laughs> but this is important. Important. You're probably going to have to take notes. You probably have some questions. And as I said, just listen. But it's interesting, too, and maybe this is shocking, but there is an undeniable discrepancy in the Gospels regarding what we're talking about here. Undeniable. And that might be shocking to somebody. Every, all of the Gospels agree that Yeshua died on Friday. But the Gospels of John, the Gospel of John, and the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell a different story. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell one story. John tells another story. <clears throat> Is everyone aware of this? Okay, well, good. That means there's some point in what we're talking about today. 
I'll point them out to you today. There's no, there's no funny jokes or stories or anything for this. We're going to jump right into it. <clears throat> I think Messianic Judaism can clear it up. Now, there's a figure that I'm going to refer to pretty regularly as we go through this, and it's from the Chronicles of the Messiah. I know it's very hard to see this, but what I want you to notice is on the top is called the Yohanin Reckoning. This is John's story of the crucifixion of Jesus. The bottom graph is the synoptic reckoning. Why are the Gospels called? Well, I'll tell you that later. I'll tell you about synoptic in a little bit. But what I want you to note right now is, John, just put them up real quick together, that's perfect. In the Johannine, or the Johannine reckoning, the Last Supper is taking place on Thursday, Nisan 13. The 13th of Nisan. By the synoptic reckoning, that meal is taking place on Thursday, the 14th of Nisan. There is a very, very important distinction that that creates and causes. Okay? According to, to John, this is Passover Eve. That this is that that the Messiah is crucified. According to the synoptics, he's crucified on Passover Day, the first day of unleavened bread, the 15th of Nisan. You're gonna have to know this too. 13, 14, 15, 16. 14th of Nisan, that's the day the lambs are slaughtered. That night becomes the 15th. Remember, night to night in Hebrew, in Jewish calendar, night to night. Slaughtered on the 14th, the lambs in the temple. The 15th, everyone gathered for their satyrs. The 16th was the second day of Passover. Okay? 13, 14, 15, 16. Those are our days that we're talking about. According to John, there's one Shabbat. It's Friday. The Passover coincides with the holiday Shabbat. Today is a day like that, in that Friday night to Saturday night welcomed the 15th of Nisan and the weekly Sabbath. That's what John says. The Synoptic Gospels say something else. They say that Friday was a holy Shabbat for the festival, that Saturday was the weekly Shabbat. Two Shabbats in the Passion Week, according to the Synoptics. You knew this, right? That there's these contradictions in here? One or two Shabbats, John says one, synoptics say two. All right, so here we go. Ready? Mark 14. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? Back to our chart. On the first day of unleavened bread, it says, the disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare the Passover for you? What does this mean? That means that this is the 14th of Nisan, and they are killing all of the lambs in the temple, or goats, it could be lambs or goats, they're killing them. And the disciples are asking Jesus, where do you want us to go and get a lamb so that we can have Passover? Okay, first day of unleavened bread. Stay with me here. 14th of Nisan translates right into in the evening, the 15th of Nisan, the first day of unleavened bread, when all of Israel was eating their Seder meal. They were killed on the 14th, sundown came, the satyrs began, everyone ate Passover, and that's what they're asking him in the Synoptic Gospels. We're going to celebrate the Passover like everyone else. Where do you want us to go and get this lamb? And as we've already made it very, very clear, that day... The 15th of Nisan is a, called a Yom Tov, okay? Today is a Yom Tov, literally a good day. It means a holiday, a special festival holiday. What this means, and I already told you, is that they were going to eat it together after sunset, which would be the 15th of Nisan, the first day of the unleavened bread. Then, then, after dinner, 
what happened. This is the first day of Passover. According to the Synoptic Gospels, after dinner, they went to the garden. He got arrested, the trial, beaten, all of that. The next day, which is still the 15th of Nisan, it's Saturday morning. Now what happens? It says it was early. So that means on the holiday of Passover, they took him before Pilate. They took him before Herod. They took, and all of this stuff happened. And then he ended up, and they, Barabbas is released. Pilate releases Barabbas on the festival of Passover. And then they go and crucify him on the day of Passover. That's what it says. Are we together on this? Okay, good. That means that by the synoptic telling of the story, the special Sabbath of the first day of Passover has already begun. It was Friday, according to our chart. Friday, Nisan 15. This is the synoptic reckoning. That means Yeshua is arrested on the 15th, tried on the Yom Tov, brought before Pilate on the Yom Tov, traded for Barabbas on the Yom Tov, crucified on the Yom Tov, removed from the cross on Yom Tov, prepared and buried on Yom Tov. Moreover, Yosef of Arimathea, Joseph of Arimathea, right? He purchased a burial garment for Yeshua. When did he purchase it? on the day that he was crucified, which was, according to this, a Sabbath. As the tomb closes on Friday night, the second day of Passover begins. That's what this is suggesting. That's what this is suggesting. Thursday night into Saturday, I mean, Friday night into Saturday night was the 15th of Nisan. Look at the graph. Friday night to Saturday night, Nisan 15. Saturday, uh, Saturday night to, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. No wonder I'm getting these funny looks. <laughs> Thursday night to Friday night was the 15th of Nisan. Friday night to Saturday night was the 16th of Nisan. That's the second day of Passover, okay? Sort of irrelevant, but just so you have some calendrical reference. It's a lot. It's complicated. Stay with me, because now we get to go to John. Here's what John says. John 13. Now before the feast of Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. And during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, girded him with a towel. When is this taking place? Read out loud the first line of John 13 for me. Before the feast of the Passover. But they're having a supper that night, right? It's not Passover. Before the feast of Passover. Do you see a problem with that relative to what we just talked about with the Synoptic Gospels, saying that Jesus and the disciples are sharing their Seder meal along with all of Israel on the first day of Passover? Is that problematic? It's at least contradictory, if not problematic. Before the feast, that's not what John is saying. John is saying, back to our chart, that Thursday was the 13th of Nisan. The 13th of Nisan. Listen to me very carefully right now. Thursday night became the 14th of Nisan, which is what? This is the day before Passover. This is the day when the lambs are sacrificed. Everything we just talked about is happening on the 14th of Nisan. So John suggests that before any of that stuff happened, Yeshua and the disciples had a Passover, or back up, a supper. Okay. So now what we see in John's connection and reckoning 
is that Thursday night after dinner, nothing really had even started yet. It was before the Feast of Passover. So they came and arrested him and took him to the courts and, and all these different things were happening on the 14th of Nisan before one lamb was sacrificed. Am I communicating clearly, Darren? Okay, good. This meal is happening 24 hours before the rest of the nation has their Passover seders. After that dinner, they come and they arrest him. Okay? We're good on that. Yeshua then is crucified on what day? It is the 14th of Nisan. It's still Friday. The days haven't really changed. He's crucified before sundown on the 14th of Nisan, right? Lambs are being sacrificed in the temple. Yeshua's on the cross, okay? Passover hasn't started. It's close, real close now. Friday afternoon, Shabbat has not started. The festival has not started. Joseph and Nicodemus close the tomb as the 15th of Nisan is starting. It's moving into Friday night, the weekly Sabbath, and the festival Sabbath, according to John. All is well in Israel. Everyone celebrating with joy their satyrs. Yeshua's in the grave. All of the Gospels, as I said, agree that he was crucified on Friday. John says Friday was the 14th of Nisan. The Synoptic Gospels say it was the 15th of Nisan. The point, I hope you're not thoroughly confused, the point is there is a discrepancy. Who's right? Bigger question is how could there be two opinions in the holy, inspired, inerrant scriptures? Who's right? Well, surely we would have to default to the synoptic gospels, right? I mean, three against one. Majority rules, if nothing else. But now I want to explain synoptic in case you don't understand that term. Almost all of modern biblical scholarship understands that Mark was the first gospel that was written. And Matthew and Luke took Mark's account and other sources that they had access to, some interesting names like Q, Quelle, German word means source, gatherings of Yeshua's sayings. They took Mark's gospel, they copied that, made some changes and additions, and created their own gospels. But Mark is the foundation. They're called synoptic because all three share a common Quelle, source. So it's not three against one, it's one against one. You understand? Synoptic, all together. John is not a synoptic gospel. John is a very mystical, Kabbalistic dude. He's into the, he's into the mystics, the mysticism. Read that from the very first line of John. But the point remains, who's right? Well, to a large degree, I'm going to tell you that answer according to scholarship. John is right. That John's chronology is given prominence in terms of how this actually happened. That does not help us if we're trying to defend the inerrancy of Scripture, does it? I want to talk to you a little bit about, first of all, there are a lot of... there. there this has confounded scholars since the beginning, since the Gospels were written in the late first century. This has confounded them because, uh, same reason I'm telling you it's confounding. What do we do with this? And so all kinds of theories have been suggested. One, that the Galileans celebrated Passover one day earlier than the Judeans. One, uh, another, that, that they were celebrating Passover already for two days in Yeshua's time. We have no Jewish historical or rabbinic corroboration of those facts. Those aren't good theories. Some suggest that Yeshua was an Essene, an Essene from Qumran, the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
Why would that be significant? Because the Essenes did not operate by a lunar calendar, they operated by a solar calendar, which meant that Passover fell every single year on the same day, and it wasn't one of these days. But he wasn't an Essene. We don't have any evidence of that either. That's a huge uh, leap. The other assumption, another one, is that this isn't a Passover Seder. That it's just not that. Many suggest that it's not a Seder, but that becomes very problematic when Yeshua says things like this. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And then he says, I've earnestly desired to do what? To eat this Passover with you. He's saying, I want to eat the Passover lamb. That's what he's saying, the Pesach. I've earnestly desired to eat the Pesach with you. The Gospels suggest that it is a Passover meal. Every one of those verses refers specifically to the lamb or the goat. And so, according to the, to the three Gospels, Yeshua told his disciples to go to the temple, sacrifice a Passover, pa roast it, bring it to the upper room, and that they ate the meat of the sacrifice that night. So, the idea that it's not a Seder, that doesn't work very well. But one thing is very interesting. John says nothing at all about a Seder. John does not make that case. He doesn't mention it one time. As a matter of fact, in John 13, we get that before the Feast of Passover, right? <clears throat> but there are more significant problems with the synoptic accounts that must be considered, and that's where we're sort of going to run this thing on rapid fire. And it is these considerations that have to point us more toward John's chronology. You still with me? I have you awake, right? You're not checked out yet. This is completely academic, completely teaching. There's no feel good. There's none of that. It's know your Bible. And sometimes we do that here, a lot of times. Problems. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all suggest that Yeshua was tried, convicted, and crucified on the 15th of Nisan. That is the first day during the festival. Okay, Mark, I want you to read what Mark says. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him, for they said, not during the festival or the people will riot. There will be major problems. We can't do this during Passover. And yet, what did I just tell you? The story says they did. Exactly that. Now, let's let that one go. Let's say, you know what? Things happen. Stuff happens, as they say. So maybe they just got delayed. That's all right. But speaking of the chief priests and the scribes, John 18, 28 brings up another interesting observation. They led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was early. They themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them, it says. Do you understand what's happening here? Remember back to the beginning of this when I told you that on the morning of the 15th, they were taking him into the trial. Remember, according to the synoptics, they all had their meal with Israel on the 14th. And on the 15th of Nisan, that's when they had the arrest and the crucifixion and all that. Look what this says very, very carefully. The priests who led Yeshua into Pilate's praetorium did not want to defile themselves so that they might be able to eat the Passover. According to the synoptic reckoning, they already ate it the last night. Do you understand that? So Pilate went out to them because they weren't going to go in there. They didn't want to defile themselves in Pilate's court. They had their lamb sacrifices coming just a little bit later that day, according to John. They had to, to prepare for the Passover. They couldn't be defiled by being in this place. And they, they wanted to sort, that was going to happen after they sorted out this nasty Jesus business. Then they could enjoy their holiday in peace. So this is happening 
before the festival, according to this reckoning. Furthermore, think about this. By the, by the, um, that means that Caiaphas, if this is happening on the 15th, according to the synoptics, that means that Caiaphas and all of his cronies conducted a trial while they should have been at home having a Passover Seder. Because that night, the 15th of Nisan, they all got together and had this mock trial and convicted him of you know, false charges. So they're conducting a trial on the festival, on the high Sabbath. That is not something that the high priest, even in their brazenness, even in their Sadducean craziness, they wouldn't have done that in front of the people of Israel. To gather and submit this guy to Roman murder? So it's very, very unlikely from those things alone that this could have happened on the first day of Passover. It's a blatant violation of Sabbath. And if nothing else, it would ruin your Passover. So there are these other last bits of consideration. Luke describes for us a burial on Friday after Yeshua's death. Okay, listen. Um, go back to the other one. Is there one? Yeah. This man went to Pilate, Joseph of Arimathea, asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud, laid him in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. Can you show me the chart real quick? It doesn't matter. Uh, the synoptic. The day of Shabbat was beginning, they said. If this was happening on Friday, according to this, it's already a Shabbat. I know I'm starting to lose people. I get it. It's okay. Let me just, let me just dial this in for you. He says, please let me take this body down. I don't want it to hang on the cross today. The Shabbat is beginning. According to that, Shabbat had already started. He was crucified on a Shabbat, according to the Synoptic Gospels. So what is the point of saying it's preparation day? What does that mean? It's Friday. We're getting ready to start the Shabbat. I don't want to leave him on the cross. Let's see who can do this for me. Kai or Lance, go in my office for me and grab my Chronicles of Messiah volume. I think it's on my desk or maybe it's in my backpack, but grab it for me. It's the only one that's out. It's got a piece of paper in it. And then furthermore, next slide with the women. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. It was already the Sabbath by the synoptic reckoning. It was Friday. It was already the Sabbath. Why would they do that? Doesn't make any sense. Regarding Joseph, I already told you. He bought a linen cloth. You can't do that on a festival Shabbat or a weekly Shabbat. Break the legs, it says. Since it was the day of preparation. When is the day of preparation? It's Friday. It's before Shabbat. That's what it's called. Thank you, sir. The day of preparation. This text says, since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that might be taken down. According to the synoptic reckoning, he's hanging on the cross on a Sabbath. Why would they ask, let us take him down before a Sabbath? It's already a Sabbath. You see the number of problems that we find here? There are a lot of them. But I want to tell you some extra biblical evidence that's very interesting as well. This is from the second century Gospel of Peter. It's apocryphal. It's not in the scriptures. It may or may not have any you know, legitimate historical memory, but probably has some. But it relates this conversation between Pilate and Herod. When Joseph of Arimathea knew that they were about to crucify him, he came to Pilate and asked for the Lord's body for burial. Pilate sent word to Herod, asking for the body. 
Herod said, Brother Pilate, even if no one had asked for him, we would have, we would have buried him, since the Sabbath is dawning. For it is written in the law that the sun must not set on one who has been killed. And he delivered him over to the people the day before the feast of unleavened bread. That's the Gospel of Peter. The Talmud has another corroboration. On the eve of Passover, they hung the Nazarene. None was found, and nothing in his defense was brought forward. And they hung him on the eve of Passover. Beyond all of the other things that I have said, having extra-biblical outside corroboration, though we can't say it's Scripture, and I understand that, it has a corroboration for John's chronology. Right? That point, I hope, has been absolutely beaten into the ground for you to understand why there is a problem. So, show me my chart. Um, yeah, that's fine. No, actually, show me the synoptics. And I want to summarize this for you. As the synoptic gospel suggests, Thursday night was the 14th. Preparations for Seder were made by the disciples. Yeshua had his Seder that night. The morning of the 15th, which is already Passover, he was tried, he was crucified, they buried him on a Shabbat, they did all this stuff. We've shown why that's a problem. John's chronology, very different. Thursday the 13th, nothing's happening. He is arrested and tried on the 14th before Passover has begun, before there's any Shabbat going on. That night he goes into the tomb before sunrise. So it counts as part of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, before sundown. 14th, no Shabbat for John. Now, <clears throat> there's a dismissal of this that I don't think is reasonable. Some people, they don't care. It just doesn't matter to them. But I think it does matter if in the greatest story ever told, there are contradictions. There are things that make it hard to know what's actually going on. I mean, what else from the Bible can we not believe if we can't reconcile the crucifixion of Jesus by the calendar? So I do think it's worth knowing. Did you know that stuff? Are you aware of these things? that there are different accounts. Well, now you do know. And it matters. And a lot of people have no clue about any of that because they don't understand the Sabbath. They don't understand the Torah. They don't understand the Passover. So that's not an accusation or problem. They either don't care or they don't know. But whether you know it or not, let me tell you who does know. The critics and the skeptics know it. And when you march in there talking about the inerrancy of Scripture and they bust out, well, John and Matthew don't even agree. Come on, tell me. Come on, tell me. What are you going to say? Well, <laughs> and even after today, you're still going to say, because that's what he said. No, you can go back and listen to this and you can take your Bibles and you can, you can open it up and you can look at the Scriptures and you can read it. But here's the point. I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you a Passover gift. And it's not matzah. I'm going to draw on Jewish history, context, culture, and interpretation to provide you a potential reconciliation to this difficulty. And it's going to tie into something important for the season that we're now moving into, which is Pesach today, Shavuot in 49 days, and the time in between is called what? The Omer, the counting of the Omer. I read some, somebody on Mighty Network said, what is the Omer? Which was a re very refreshing to me because that means... There's a lot of room to teach about something that people don't know. But that's the season we're in. Tonight, we count the first night of the Omer. So I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to give you this gift with this potential reconciliation because in my mind, it's a big deal. 
And whether today's Yeshua disciples admit it or not, skeptics like to do it. If there is this problem in the God-breathed scriptures, if they're not perfect, the house of cards falls from there. I don't like problems, so I'm going to solve them in some way. I'm going to give you a logical, powerful, contextual, and totally hypothetical consideration for how we can solve this problem. Okay? Next week. Hog Sameach. Got to come back.